Angela's just stopped turning me from the cabinet re shovel. <laughs> so I heard from behind. Right, our next speaker needs very little introduction. A filmmaker of international fame who's made a body of work celebrating the lives of working people, their struggles and their glories. And he made a big mistake because he included me in a Labour Party political broadcast, which you don't know if it comes during the election. So please big, give a big hand to Ken Lodge, Director of I, Daniel Gray. This is an unimaginable honour for someone who has tried to tell stories of working class life for many years, but to be here surpasses all that. This is a great, great honour. And thank you, Joe, and thank you, Aaron. And if I go on too long, Joe, give us a kiss. <laughs> Look, this, this meeting is not only a demonstration of your strength and your, um, and your confidence, it's also a meeting that shows what we are capable of. It shows that we are standing at a moment of great hope. Why is it a moment of hope? Because we have a Labour leadership that for the first time in my memory stands with the people. And the second issue of hope is that the, the wind is in our sails. They won a, nearly won a great victory and they will be next time. This wind is with us. But there's, we have to ask why has Jeremy made the connection to people he has? And I think it's because he and the others with him say simple truths that people recognize. They say we don't have to live with inequality. We don't have to live with grotesque wealth that doesn't pay taxes and desperate poverty on the other hand. We don't have to treat our vulnerable people, sick and disabled, to humiliate them, to starve them, to give them a choice of staying warm or going hungry. We don't force them into food banks. This government has used hunger as a weapon. And if you're poor, they say your poverty is your own fault. Another simple truth that Jeremy and John and the others say is that we can build houses for everyone. We don't have to build penthouses that stay empty as investments while others are forced into unsafe towers. And listening to Matt, who spoke with such eloquence and power, I had to think there are two moralities here. There's the morality in this field, there's a morality of people here of solidarity and mutual support and care for each other and that the morality of the other side which is greed, which is selfishness, which is gated communities and they're quite different. Our morality will triumph in the end. Another simple truth, a simple truth. We can take care of each other's health without people making a profit from it. We don't need Richard Branson to get another private island in the Caribbean for us to cure our sick. And we can invest in real jobs, real jobs that are secure, that are not bogus self-employed, where people don't wait for a phone call last minute at night to see if they got a shift next day. We can invest in real jobs making things people really need and give, give workers the security of a wage that will sustain a family where they can have a house. That security with jobs, that's fundamental to Labour's programme. And another simple truth, a simple, simple truth. We can educate our children 
without giving them a lifetime's burden of debt. Well, all this is possible, is possible, but we're not there yet, not by a long chalk. We're going to need the fighting spirit of people here and fighting spirit shown by the, the brave people who have kept the, as it's been mentioned already, the, the Orgrid campaign for truth and justice. That must carry on and succeed. And I'd like to link that with the Ricky Tomlinson's campaign to clear his name in the Shrewsbury Pickets. Rick is, Rick is a good long-time friend and comrade and I know he needs our strength to get that wrong righted. So, for the Shrewsbury Pickets. And also we need the fighting spirit of people here, the teaching assistants of Durham, who wage a wonderful campaign. And they need a settlement when no one loses wages or conditions or jobs. And I'd like to tell you about the fighting spirit of some people from my union, Vic Two, the Film Workers Union, the Picture House Workers in London and elsewhere, who are fighting for a living wage and trade union rights. And they've had three of their union reps sacked. So they need your strength and your solidarity too, the Picture House Workers of London. And one struggle, one struggle that is, that really brings cheer to us all. And that's a story I heard only yesterday, and that's in Sheffield, where a job centre is being closed, or should be closed, intended to be closed by the Department of Work and Pensions. The job centre staff are going on strike, not for their own jobs, but for, in solidarity with the people who need that service. Now that, that's our morality. And I'm only sorry that Ian Duncan Smith is not there when they win, because win they will. Well, the long dark night that began with Thatcher in 79 may be coming to an end. Let's hope. Her attacks on the working class uh, laws against trade unions and everything that followed, the viciousness of the miners' strike, that memory may be come to an end, and with it, and with it, the memory that followed of Blair and his privatisation and his illegal war. That is coming to an end. But the closer we get to power, make no mistake, the more vicious the attacks will get and the stronger we will need to be. If we think we've been under attack, we ain't seen nothing yet. And let's remember, let's remember the dirty tricks that they played in the past, things that were said about the people, of, great people that have led our movement, like Tony Benn and Arthur Scargill and others, the lies that were told about them. There will be lies, there will be dirty tricks, and we better stay strong. And for that, for that we need a united movement. And now I want to be contentious on this day of unity. We need representatives in Parliament who are committed to this program and will not work against it. And we need, we need an injection of democracy because most people in trade unions have to be elected. And I think it's perfectly democratic that when members have served a particular time in Parliament, then they have to be reaffirmed or reconfirmed by their members. Because we can't have we cannot have the disgusting attacks that went on against Jeremy, that went on against Jeremy in the last Parliament. And let's have a
an extension of democracy throughout the whole party. The organization, the governing body, that should all be elected by the members overwhelmingly. And further, we need union leaders, and I'm not speaking about anyone here, we need union leaders who will not only talk left, but act left. With all that, with all that, with your great strength, with your determination, with your discipline, then yes, we can win. And Labour can be the party that the Labour movement has always needed, and not in my lifetime had. And public good, the public good can finally triumph over private greed. If we remember the strength of our determination here, yes, we can, we can overcome, we can get there. Yes, we can. And I'll let finish with one sentence from hundreds of years ago from a man called John Ball, who led the Peasants' Revolt, and he described socialism. He talked about socialism today, but he described it, and it was about public ownership and popular control, and he said, nothing shall go well until all things be held in common. That's socialism. Yeah. I would like the members of the press and photographers to try and keep it on a bit. There's people obviously you want to uh, listen to speakers and watch them. I appreciate that. I mean, the crowd here has, uh, has came to look and see our speakers. So let's have a bit of cooperation, please, right? I've got an announcement to make that uh, Bill, there was a night from Doncaster, unfortunately he's been taken ill. The St. John Ambulance Brigade have taken him to Dry Ben Hospital. That's just if some of his friends and colleagues don't know where he's at, right? Right, continue on. Next speaker, Len McCluskey, General Secretary of Unite. <laughs> Len is a stalwart of the Durham Miners Gala. He's addressed his gathering on numerous occasions and he's welcome here again. Come on, Len. Jeremy Corbyn, oh Jeremy Corbyn, oh Jeremy Corbyn, oh Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, comrades and friends, I haven't been able to wipe the smile off my face since the 8th of June. What a fantastic campaign by Jeremy to take us on the brink of government. I want to be an indication for all of us who supported Jeremy. And I'm proud of the role that I and my union unite played. Proud that we stood firm despite the vicious attacks against us. Proud that we defended Labour Party democracy. I'm proud that we stood shoulder to shoulder with a decent, honest man, a passionate man, prepared to fight for our class and our values. <laughs> and comrades, how fitting it is that Jeremy should be here in Durham to be gre greeted by such a crowd. I've been to many miners, gallers over the years, but this has been the biggest, the largest, and the proudest one I've ever seen. Just like I've never seen rallies like those for Jeremy Corbyn during the election campaign. It's extraordinary. It demonstrates the enthusiasm of our movement that has built for Jeremy's vision, an enthusiasm that must continue if we are to bring down the Tories. That's why I'm incredibly honoured to be sharing a platform here today with our Prime Minister in waiting, Jeremy Corbyn. My comrades, comrades, let me say how delighted I am also uh, 
to share a platform with the new chair of the Labour Party, Ian Flavoury. The chair of the Labour Party who's a socialist. Now there's a change. And to say to everyone here who helped to fight such a remarkable, courageous campaign and who helped turn Labour fortunes around in such spectacular a fashion, propelling our Labour Party to the brink of power. Of course, there's someone who's missing from the stage today who's already been mentioned. He would have been delighted and humbled by the turnout. And I want to pay my personal homage to Davy Hopper, my friend, a giant of our movement, lost to us just a year ago. He was so deeply rooted in this great mining community and is hugely missed this weekend. But as Joe said, Davy's spirit and solidarity lives on in this scholar. Davy brought passion and grit to the fight to improve lives of working people. Working people for whom hope is something desperately needed now. Under Jeremy's leadership, Labour now gives that hope. New voters are turning to Labour, a generation written off as not interested in politics, inspired to find their voice through their vote. Parents who are fed up working hard but getting nowhere. The teachers, nurses, police staff and firefighters. The people who go more than the extra mile for us but I'll have too little money at the end of the month. And just everyday voters whose stomachs are turned by a Tory party that has bought its survival with taxpayers' money. And comrades, what a slap in the face for the merchants of doom who have continually told us that you cannot get the British electorate to vote for a radical programme. They told us that Labour's left-wing manifesto would bury us. They threw every smear they could from their gutters at our leader. And where did it get them? Nowhere. Because voters, voters aren't stupid. They can see what the Labour manifesto meant. They can see it for themselves. It offers belief and optimism. It shows that another way is possible. And the only thing buried by our manifesto was Theresa May's majority. You know, Labour's manifesto has achieved something quite extraordinary. And I don't say this tongue-in-cheek. It has united the party more than it's been for years. Just think of how much has changed since 2015. Going into the election, we had a pro-austerity shadow chancellor and a leader bittering around austerity light. The country didn't know what Labour stood for, who it stood for, so it rejected Labour. Jeremy was elected promising to make our party true Labour again, despite the conniving by those who tried to knife him in the back and break him. Jeremy stayed strong. team pulled our party together. Labour became unequivocally anti-austerity and everyone, everyone in the PLP is now anti-austerity. They produced a fantastic new vision for our country. They gave the people the chance to believe that another world really is possible. Jeremy, you and our Labour Party are the very definition of strong and stable and decent government that this country hungers for. Comrades, credit goes to Jeremy's team as well. They themselves subject to vile and vicious attacks who pulled together a fantastic manifesto which has captured the imagination of millions of millions of people, renationalising our NHS public ownership of our railways and the post office, £10 minimum wage, zero hours abolished agency labour and bogus self-employment dealt with, a British investment bank regenerating manufacturing, regional investment banks to regenerate our regions 
I could go on and on and on. It was like a Christmas tree. There was a present on it for everybody. Everyone now in the PLP supports the program and they need to continue to give that support. So no more self-indulgent jaunts like Chukka Amuna and his merry band <laughs> seeking to return <coughs> to their old undermining ways. Let me say something to them. The massive increases in your majorities, in your constituencies, went down to your own personal charisma. It was down to the Corbyn bounce and the manifesto and you should respect that. Maybe the share of the vote was more than any other leader in any other election since Attlee in 45 with the biggest socialist party in Europe and we need to maintain the momentum and I use the word momentum deliberately. Country Contrary to those who seek to demonise members of Momentum, I welcome them as a breath of fresh air seeking the change needed to create a better Britain. You know, that was the problem with New Labour. It never challenged the structures of wealth and power in this country. Nine years on since the financial collapse, they have no answers, no vision to deal with the inequality in our society and we can say without equivocation and very loud and clear, Blairism is finally dead. Yeah. And with our new version, and our new vision, Labour is just one more heave away from office. Jeremy has won the hearts and minds of millions of people. People tired of austerity. In these weeks since the election, there has been a real sense that fights against the cuts can succeed. The anger at the Tories' refusal to lift the pay freeze is palpable. It spilled out onto the streets of London last Saturday in that fantastic rally, not one more day. The people, the people they refuse to give a few pounds more to are the nurses, doctors, paramedics, police support staff and other emergency service workers. Those workers ran towards danger to save the lives of those targeted in the horrific terrorist attacks at Westminster, Manchester, London Bridge and Finsbury Park while others fled in fear of their lives. I have nothing but praise and admiration for them. And the firefighters and the firefighters with a magnificent leader like Matt Rapp. Fearless in the face of danger who ran in and fought the fire at Grenfell. How dare Theresa May and her bung parliaments insult the heroism and dedication of those who tried to save those lives, denying them a few quid more in their wage packets. How dare the Tories ever again praise our emergency heroes or look in the eye the people who teach our children, clean our streets, or tend our sick. They are an affront to the values of this country. We, we're told it's finally dawning on those thieving Tories that people are wary of austerity. Because that's what austerity is. It's theft. Yet still, still they claim there's no money for sprinklers in towers. No money for schools, no money for RHS, while bunging £1 million, and that's for starters, to the DUP in order to cling on to power. Now don't get me wrong, comrades, Unite is the biggest union in Northern Ireland. I'm pleased for the workers there that there's going to be more money for their communities and services. But if they can find money to invest in Northern Ireland, it must be found for all of our regions. You know, a, a billion pound would go a long way to help regenerate the northeast and the industries that are needed here. Tory politics exposes the sickening hypocrisy of this squalid and shaky government. Because the deepest hair from the cuts they are making in working class communities 
is yet to be felt. Our kids will feel the pain in their classrooms. Our sick will feel when they wait too long to be treated and tended in our struggling NHS. Our friends and neighbours feel it when their wallet and purses are empty and the cupboard is bare. Resentment at what the Tories do to cling on to power can only grow. Day by day, revulsion will deepen. This shameless government cannot last. It does not deserve to last. They showed us exactly what this government means for working people. There's no shortage of cash for bribes in return for votes. But when you need it, when you need it, Nothing falls from Theresa's magic money tree. She won't even bother to try and shake it for you. And while grubby Tory deals are forged, the working class again have to fight for their own justice. As has already been said, 20 years on, finally justice was done over Hillsborough. We're going to have to do it all over again at Grenfell, at Orgreave and other injustices. We demand that the inquiry into Grenfell is open and broad and genuinely independent. Only then can we trust light will shine on what really happened in the atrocity of that tower. A Tory council awash with reserves to bribe rich voters, unable or unwilling to protect working class people in their homes, incapable of accepting responsibility for the terrible loss of life, inept when it came to organising any relief efforts. Kensington Council, a Tory council, the UK's richest, is a symbol for all that is rotten in Tory Britain. And comrades, let's not forget the 72 Tory landlord MPs who voted down the Labour bill that would have forced private landlords to make their homes fit for human habitation. Shame on you, I say, shame on you. <laughs> Labour has told the truth about the price we pay for cuts because austerity kills. In the words of the poet Ben Oakry, in this age of austerity, the poor die for others' prosperity. Grenfield stands as a symbol of Tory Britain, profit and greed before people. So I agree with John Macdonald. The residents who died in Grenfell Tower were murdered, murdered, murdered by years of local authority cuts, by corporate greed and by uncaring capitalism. Comrades, I want to finish on this. We live in extraordinary times but the one thing that will never change and Angela was right the Tories believe that they are entitled to rule us that they are the natural party of government they will fight the next election with more ruthlessness and brutality than ever before we must be ready for them we must keep our focus laser trained on victory we must maintain the momentum we've built up we must stay 100% behind Jeremy and his government in waiting. We must continue to give hope that a better Britain really is possible. Above all, we must stay united. Because the sooner the Tories are gone, the sooner Labour can get on with restoring dignity, decency and economic sanity in this country. This, this comrades, is our time now. It's time for the government of the people. It's time for the ten pounds on our basic wage. It's time for homes to be built and to be fit for humans. It's time to take back control of our public services, our transport and our NHS. It's time the greedy bastards paid their taxes. It's time. It's time for our children to feel hope again. It's time to put people before profits. It's time for labour. It's time for the many, not the few. Thank you, Colin.
I'd like to thank Lenny Percy for keeping that short. <laughs> right. Let's have one big Derminers Gala cheer for the next Prime Minister of the Scurry, Jeremy Corbyn! Association to go in the library and the inscription on it says thank you for all you do your inspiration to so many and your solidarity for all it's a copy of for the many not the few for the Dear Miners Association thank you for that wonderful welcome and thank you for your support for all the brilliant speakers we've had on the stage here this afternoon because it's this assembly that gives us all hope and gives us all strength and gives us all confidence and I can't forget the wonderful support you've given over the past years to so many people and so many causes and the way in which because of what you've done, because of the work you've put in, the political debate and the standards of debate and the subject of debate in Britain have changed completely in our direction because of your solidarity. I want also to pay a very personal and big heartfelt tribute to Davy Hopper and Davy Guy for all that they did over so many years for the Durham Miners Association and the mining communities all over the North East and indeed all over the country. They went through the horrors of the miners' strike. They went through the brutality of the miners' strike. They went through the political attack on the mining communities. And at the end of that, they could have walked away and said, God, that was awful. Let's do something else with our lives. They said, no. The gala will carry on, the gala will grow, the gala will build on the strength of the mining communities that all the other communities can learn from that. Unity is strength, solidarity is important, solidarity is vital. <laughs> Davy Hoppers and Davy Guy's families are here today and I express to them my warmth, my solidarity and my support. I was talking to Maria this morning, talking to others from the families today. We're never going to forget those two for all they did for our communities because they inspired so much more to come from so many more. Thank you, Davy Hopper. Thank you, Davy Guy. When we march here, we enjoy the music, we enjoy the banners, and we enjoy understanding that solidarity that goes with it. This isn't just a festival, this is something very different. It's the biggest celebration of working class culture, of working class art, of working class music anywhere in Europe that's held today. And it shows that Durham teaches the whole world just what inspiration, just what ability and just what creativity is there. There, born out of desperation, born out of struggle, born out of ambition, and above all, born out of pride, pride in the communities and pride in the region. Those miners' banners show all the brutality and all the injustice that existed in the mining industry from the inception of the mining industry onwards, the cruelty of the treatment of miners, the disregard for their lives, for their health, for their safety, the way in which children were put down the pits, 
and I'm wearing the badge of Keir Hardy today. He himself was a child worker in a pit. He went on to educate himself and, as Angela so brilliantly explained, was educated by the Labour movement. Who says that somebody born in poverty can't achieve the greatest things if given the chance and given the opportunity? And the lessons we learn from that, the lessons we learn are that when we're in solidarity and support each other, we go forward as communities, we go forward and achieve things for everybody else. Those struggles in the mining communities, down the pits, in the general strike, eventually led to public ownership in 1947 and a whole new era of investment and of safety in the mining industry. And then along came the political attack on the industry by Margaret Thatcher and by the economics that she represented. I tell you what, never again must we go through a political attack on a community such as Thatcher Mountain against the mining community. Never again must we accept the economics that leads to that kind of decision. But when I talk about changing the political debate, I put it to you in this way. There was a global financial crash in 2008-2009, brought about by unregulated banks, brought about by greed, brought about by tax havens, brought about by a subprime mortgage crisis that was so grievously brutal towards many of the poorest people in the United States. And it was then imported here. Imported here through a policy, a political choice of imposing austerity on the people of this country as was done in many other parts of Europe. There was nothing of an economic necessity about that decision. There was no need to do it. You don't cut your way to prosperity. You invest your way to prosperity. And so, in this general election campaign, we called time on austerity, we called time on the neocon economics that leads to austerity and the thinking around it. But let me just give you a few facts about the consequences of seven years of austerity. The average chief executive officer of a FTSE 100 company, or indeed any other major company, earns now 187 times more than the average wage of somebody working in that organization. That gap and that discrepancy has grown year on year. Year on year it gets worse. No wonder they got so angry and so excited when during the election campaign and before I said we would use the power of public procurement to reduce the gap between the CEO and the average worker. And in modern Britain today, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, the fifth richest country in the world, six million of our fellow citizens, six million, are earning less than the living wage. Not right, not necessary. We will bring in a living wage of £10 an hour as per the TUC recommendation. And NHS workers so quickly praised by every Tory minister whenever anything goes wrong and I'm sure they're utterly charming to them whenever they go to the GP or to the hospital have very generously taken a 14% cut in their wages in the past seven years due to the public sector pay cap. And when the vote came in Parliament on the public sector pay cap, where were all those Tories and all their crocodile tears? Voting to keep the cap. Voting to continue the suppression of public sector wages. And you'd have thought in a wealthy country like modern Britain, we could afford to ensure that all our children have a decent chance in life. No, there are four million, four million children in modern Britain living in poverty. 
for whom their parents' prospect of a summer holiday from school is a nightmare. Because no longer will they get access to a school breakfast or a school meal. It'll be holiday hunger for them because the school is closed and those meals are not available. Not necessary, not right, and in my view, fundamentally immoral in modern Britain. We've had 10 years of wages going down, going down because of austerity. And the symptom, not the cause, the symptom of the housing crisis, and I'll come on to more of that in a moment, the symptom of those desperate people sleeping outside the main stations in every city, begging to survive or begging to get the money to go into a night shelter. Is anybody really happy at the idea that a few thousand people are forced to sleep on our streets every night because we as a society can't somehow or other get it together to provide housing for all of our citizens? And the use of food banks is up and so many of our young people's ambitions are denied through their underachievement in school, often because of the poverty that they've grown up in and come from. None of this is right and none of this is necessary. And I tell you what, those on middle incomes, many of those doing relatively well in society, are also very unhappy in living in such a deeply unequal society where the only thing they can do is give help to food banks in order that the hungry can get something to eat. I don't want to live in a Britain of food banks. I want to live in a Britain where people are properly fed because they're paid the wages to be able to afford the food. And so I was very proud to lead our election campaign this summer. And the commentariat wrote us off. The broadsheet newspapers wrote us off. Most of the media wrote us off and said, well, put up a manifesto like that. Nobody's ever going to vote for anything like that. As if people like the idea that there is poverty, injustice, inequality, underfunded schools, underfunded hospitals, low pay in work, increasing disinvestment, as if people want that. No, we went out there. We went out there with a message of something very different. Under Labour, austerity would end. Under Labour, we would invest in the future. Under Labour, we would respect and bring communities together, not drive them apart. And so, what we unlocked in the campaign was not just the excitement of youth, it wasn't just the concerns of older people, it was this fundamental unease, unease that a society can go on in this direction, with poverty and inequality alongside rising, very rapidly rising, huge levels of individual wealth for a very small number of people. So what we were doing was saying there would be real security for older people, would be real security for older people through a national care service where they did it. All those with special needs or disabilities would get it. They wouldn't be penalised because they had dementia. We also offered hope to younger people, hope to younger people that they're not going to be poorer than their parents' generation and their children won't be poorer than them. They're fed up with the story of the cascading of poverty from one generation to another while the world becomes infinitely richer and the grotesque levels of, the, of wealth of the super rich gets greater and greater. Nobody's happy with that if they really think about it. And so we got that support because we were offering something very, very different. And I want to thank everybody that worked so hard in our campaign. Those that knocked on doors to identify votes, those that mobilised people to register to vote, and almost two million registered to vote before the election date was called, or the cut-off date took place, those that campaigned in public rallies and meetings and events, 
and those that campaign on social media so that the conversation changed the conversation changed into one about what you could do in a society not what you couldn't or were not allowed or not able to do we raised the whole question of real solidarity, real solidarity and what it means. But you know something, the Tories went into this election thinking it was going to be a walk in the park and it became a walk in the dark and a nightmare for them by the end of it. But you know what, I'm not sure they've actually learnt very many lessons from it. I'm really not sure about that at all. Because uh, they've done a deal with the DUP, which has cost them a billion pounds, and as Len quite correctly says, the same levels of investment around the rest of the country would mean 50 billion pounds being invested in all of the English regions. Money going into Scotland and money going into Wales. But no, they've got a billion pounds to buy 10 votes in Parliament. They've got a billion pounds for those 10 votes to stay in office and they can't find a hate near a penny for the health workers, education workers or any other group in the public sector. And you know what? Their contempt, their contempt for people standing up against injustice knows no bounds. There's debate in Parliament the other day on the WASPy women. Women who've been so brutally treated by the state pension system and so suffering as a result of it. And there was this debate in which many Labour colleagues put forward very strong and very good arguments about why there's a special deal needed for the WASPy women. And do you know what the Tory MP, Tory Minister replying said? It's quite important that these women understand the need to go back into the jobs market. We can offer them apprenticeships. What kind of insult to humanity is that? What kind of contempt is that for women who've worked very hard all their lives, paid into the system that they might get a pension when they retire? And the retirement date was arbitrarily changed and they suffered as a result of it. But I've got good news for the Tories. I know they're living through a nightmare at the moment. And I'm somebody, as you're very well aware, doesn't involve in himself in personal abuse and would never exploit somebody else's misfortune. And so I want to help these Tories out of their nightmare. Feel free at any time to resign and we'll have another general election. The Labour vote, the Labour vote went up by three million. The biggest increase in the Labour vote at any time since before I was born. In, indeed, the biggest since 1945. And that didn't happen because of the kindness of the press barons. It happened because of the decency and generosity of ordinary people all across this country who saw the need to do things differently and better. And so, our campaign will be out there all this summer. We'll be out there campaigning in every one of the 73 marginal seats we intend to gain in that general election, so that we populate Parliament with Labour MPs committed to carrying out the changes needed. But we also, we also endorse, work with and enjoy the strength, the solidarity and the support of trade unions, of community organisations and of people all together. Parliament alone will not change this society. It's what we all do in our daily lives and in our campaigns that is so important. I want to say a particular welcome to the new MPs that have been elected for the North East region in the general election. 
I'm joined on the platform here by at least 20 colleagues from the Parliamentary Labour Party and of those that have been re-elected, all of them with vastly increased majorities, I say welcome back and well done. One person I really want to welcome back because he's such a dear friend and such an inspiration to all of us is my great friend, Dennis Skinner. Is the embodiment, Dennis is the embodiment of working class decency, respect and humanity and determination to always represent those that have put him into Parliament in the first place. Newly elected MPs for the region, Liz Twist in Bladen, Laura Pitcock. Paul Williams, Mike Hill, and joined here today on the platform from other regions. Can I say a big welcome to Hugh Gaffney from Cambridge, <laughs> Stephanie Peacock from Barnsley, Marsha de Cordovo from Battersea, the seat everybody said we couldn't win and we did. Well done, Marsha. And to somebody who just crept in with a tiny majority of only 32,000, Dan Carden from Liverpool Walton. <laughs> I want to pay tribute and acknowledge John Cummings who died earlier this year. Former Labour MP and miner, great friend, great supporter of the mining community. Always remember those that have gone before and remember the pain their families go through for years and years afterwards. That's what makes us strong and together as a community. And I want to say a particular thank you to all of those that helped with the organisation of the general election campaign in so many ways, both at local and national level. Two people played to me a particularly crucial role in that, and that was Andrew Gwynn and Ian Lavery in coordinating our campaign. And Ian Lavery has now taken on the job of party chair in order to prepare for the next election. Ian, to Andrew, thank you for all you do. Where are you, Ian? Those challenges are for us all now. The challenges of what we do to challenge austerity. The challenge of the lessons we learn from the mining communities and so many others. There are injustices that have been done and injustices that have been challenged. And I know how hard it is to fight through to change a judicial decision that is wrong or to get an inquiry into misbehaviour and misdemeanours by those in power and those in office. I've been through campaigns on Guildford and Birmingham and other injustices and I know how hard it is. I want to pay a tribute to all those Hillsborough families that worked so hard with such determination for so long to get to finally get their justice. But I've been talking to our shadow teams, all of our shadow teams on what policies we will develop when we go into government. And it's very, very clear to me that the first decision, the first decision that must be made by Diane Abbott when she becomes Home Secretary is to order a public inquiry into Orgree and a public inquiry into Shrewsbury. And we will do that. Matt spoke brilliantly about the way the firefighters responded to the Grenfell Tower fire. I was there with him the next day and words are hard to find when you're talking to firefighters who ran into a burning building when they were told not to, borrowed police, policemen's riot shields in order to stop burning debris falling on them as they ran into that building knowing full well they might not come out of it. Brave beyond belief. And I was talking to them with Matt 
And I said to one of them, Matt will remember this very well, I said to him, why did you do it when you knew how dangerous it was? He said, well, there's a chance of saving a life. We will go in and save that life. That is what we do as firefighters. But what Grenfell also showed us, what Grenfell also showed us was the crisis of housing across the whole country. A towering inferno of poor people being burnt to death in a dangerous building in the richest borough in the United Kingdom. Full praise to the firefighters, the ambulance workers, the paramedics, the police, the community volunteers who rushed to the scene to try and do their best to help out. But what is it about modern Britain that the ability to rehouse 400 people suddenly becomes a natural, a national catastrophe that has to be dealt with by central government because we so cut back on public services, cut back on local government, cut back on social housing provision, sold off so much council housing and so many opportunities for so many people. So the lessons of Grenfell are of course to make our buildings safe, but they're also to properly fund fire inspections, building control inspections, planning inspectors, properly fund fire safety measures and invest, invest in decent quality housing for all. Too many of our children are growing up in grossly overcrowded private rented flats where it's hard to do their homework. They don't know if they're going to be there in six months time. They might have to move school. Their life chances are being damaged as very small children because of their housing insecurity. A Labour government will invest not in luxury homes in the London suburbs. We'll be investing in good quality housing for the people that need good quality housing all over the country. But the election was about health care. It was about investment in our NHS and ending the dicing up, slicing up, cutting up and privatising of our NHS. It's the most precious national institution we have. We will invest in our NHS, not cut it, not damage it, not charge for it, and not destroy it. But it's also about the future generation. In every child there is hope, in every child there is ambition, in every child there is creativity. Bring our children together in the very youngest years, because so much what happens long before they get to school is so important. So we will give at least 30 hours per week free opportunities for all preschool children to come together to play centres, to preschool, to children's centres, so that that short start that we were so proud of in the past will become a reality for all of our children. And we want to properly fund our schools our primary schools, so that when the children go there, they're not in oversized classes, they're not in supersized classes, they don't have a head teacher who is so stressed because they haven't got the money to run the school properly, they're spending their time on fundraising when they should be spending their time on teaching. We will invest in schools and education for all of our children. And it's about all people that work in a school, the head teacher, the teachers, and the crucial work done by the vital work of teaching assistants, support staff, and all the others. They deserve that justice as well. And to ensure that hungry children are fed and that all children eat a meal together, we will invest the money. It's been criticised by many. I'm very proud of the proposal we're putting forward, and I'll be even prouder to carry it out. That is, a free school meal every day for every primary school child, eating it together. And our children must be equipped with the skills they need 
the construction toys, the science, the maths, the English, and all the things they need to learn in school. Those are absolutely vital for the future of all of us. But it's also about unleashing the creativity in all of our children. So I'm also very proud of the part of our manifesto that said we would have a pupil arts premium that every child can learn a musical instrument in school and every child can take part in that creativity. But it's also about what young people want to achieve in life and society. If a young person wants to be an electrician, wants to be a plumber, wants to be an architect, wants to be a scientist, then it's up to all of us to help them down that road. If we charge fees to go to college, what happens? The debt builds up, the students drop out. What happens if you charge £9,000 a year to go to university and leave with a 50000 debt? People can't cope with the stress, can't cope with the debt, they drop out and, the, and that debt still stays with them till they reach, reach retirement age. Well, other countries do it differently. They value education and they value adult education as well, that we might go back to college later in life to learn something different, learn a new skill or want to explore new ideas. And again, I was heavily criticised for this and we were as a party the costs of doing it. Personally, I'm quite prepared to bear those costs and quite prepared to do it. So, we would, yes, tax to do it. We would increase corporation tax. We would increase tax at the top end of the scale. And to misquote what a Tory MP once said about mass unemployment during the Thatcher years when he said it was a price worth paying, I say the tax price to educate all our young people is a price well worth paying. And so, that's the offer we make of a Britain that will work for the many, not the few. That our railways will be run by the public for the benefit of the public who have invested in them already that our postal service will be run by the public for the public who have already invested in it, that our water services, instead of creaming off their profits to put in tax havens elsewhere, would be publicly run so the profits go in to investing in conservation measures and supporting a decent water system for the whole country, and that energy systems could be run by local communities and local authorities with more sustainable energy usage and generation for all. All these things are possible if you have a government that's prepared to think differently to those that have gone before. I'll finish on this. In Hamburg today, the G20 are meeting. Theresa May is apparently having a chat with Donald Trump. I can't really imagine what's going on in that meeting. And somebody asked me today, what would you be saying if you were meeting Donald Trump today? I said, well, there's a couple of things I want to say to Donald Trump. Well, there'll be more than two, actually, but I'd start with these two. The first one is, we live on one planet. We inherit a planet from those that went before. It's not ours to destroy, it's not ours to pollute, it's not ours to damage, it's ours to protect and preserve. So don't walk away from the achievement of the Paris Climate Change Accord. Walk towards it that we all might live in a safer planet in the future. And I suspect that uh, our Prime Minister might also be talking about some special trade deal with the United States in the future, which I suspect will look awfully like the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. I tell you this, a Labour government wouldn't be signing up to any trade treaty that imported bad working conditions, exported unemployment, and brought poorer quality, worse conditions to our shelves, our marketplaces and our homes. We would be promoting trade that increases job protection, increases job security, improves the products and the safety we all have and 
has a human rights clause attached to it too, so that we don't condone human rights abuses under the guise of free trade around the world. And we would be calling time on the Thatcher-Reagan legacy, the Thatcher-Reagan legacy of redistribution of wealth for the wealthiest at the expense of the poorest. Let the free market rip and let the rest go to hell. The poorest and most vulnerable in so many parts of the world have already paid that price. It's not right for them, it's not right for us, it's not necessary. It does require a different vision of a different world. A world where you work to reduce the differences, not increase them. Where you don't go to war at the drop of a hat, instead you have a foreign policy based on peace, democracy, justice and human rights. And you recognize those poor people who are refugees around the world never ask to be refugees. They're the product of environmental disasters, they're the product of wars, they're the product of human rights abuses. And you know what? They've also all got ideas and ambition. They also all want to contribute to all the other things in our society. And, uh, wait, can I Please. And can I conclude with this? Can I conclude with this, please? Can I just uh, conclude with this? Uh, can I just conclude with this thought? If we want that world where we respect those rights of people, can, yes, I am. But can I finish the sentence, please? please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you in a moment. Okay. If somebody wants to have a chat with me about a couple of things, I'm very happy to do that in a moment. I do talk to everybody. I just finished with this, I was at a, some years ago, I was at a refugee camp in Syria and I was talking to people stuck on no man's land between the Iraq and Syrian border. This was before the war reached its extremities in Syria. And this family were living in a tent, getting a bit of food and trying to get by, but some of them had died in fires in the tent in a very cold winter. Their lives were pretty desperate, they were in a pretty desperate situation. And this young girl was sitting on the floor of the tent, she'd be about 12, 13, something like that. And I was talking to her through an interpreter and I said, what's your ambition? What do you want to achieve in life? And do you know what she said to me? I want to be a doctor. Her determination, her belief in herself, her belief in her community, those beliefs and those determinations are universal. It's a human spirit and a human condition that we always reach out for others and try and achieve for others. So the message we give today from Durham at this fantastic gala today is that united we can achieve so much. United we can change the face of this country. United we can give real hope and opportunities to young people here and help those around the world that also need those rights and that hope and that opportunity. It's our strength and our solidarity that can achieve so many of these things. And those that, uh, those that uh, write and think so much and poetry around the world can also tell us quite a lot. And I want to finish with this quote from John Cornford. John Cornford was a young British person in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. John Cornford died 50 years ago this week. 50 years ago this week, he died, killed by fascists in Spain while he was doing his best for justice and for liberty. And his words are these, and history forming is in our hands. Not plasticine, but roaring sands. Yet we must swing to its final course. We 
are the future. The last fight, let us face. John Cornford, 1937, in Spain. Boom! Thank you very much. Boom! Stay together. Boom! In solidarity. I'll call upon the chairman of the General Mind Association to give a brief word to the fans. Thank you very much. Oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, wasn't that extraordinary? Yes. The General Miners Gala hasn't seen a leader of the Labour Party like this since Clement Attlee addressed it in 1947, 70 years ago. That, was, that year was for socialism the nationalisation of the coal industry as well. In the tradition of the Durham miners, I'd like to state our appreciation to all of our speakers for their tremendous contributions today. Thank you. I formally move a vote of thanks on behalf of the DMA, its executive and all the members in County Durham. Many thanks. Please have a safe journey home. See you next year. The 134th Miners Gala. Thank you. Everyone, thank you for watching. If you wish to use this video, if you are from non-profit organizations, you are more than welcome to use this video in part, whole, or edited in any way you wish with our full blessing from ONM. If, however, you are from a for-profit organization or you make any money from your videos, then please negotiate rates prior to any use of this video. Anyone found using this video without permission shall be prosecuted. You shall pay way more heavily unless you make arrangements first. <laughs>